Household Souls. Thank you so much for clicking on this video. My name is Carolyn and this channel is all about true crime, mystery, and anything abnormal. I highly recommend subscribing because this channel is definitely a vibe. Have I got a wild story for you today. We're talking about a woman named Candy. Now, this is not Candy Montgomery, which there was a Netflix show out recently about her and she's just a whole hot mess on her own. We're talking about a woman by the name of Candace Mosley. Candace Mosley had the life that most people would look at and be envious of. She had a absolutely wonderful life. She was gorgeous. She had a lot of money. She was very charitable and she really had this public persona of really caring deeply about different causes and publicly she seemed like a wonderful woman, the type of woman that anyone would want to know. But the problem was it, Candy, she had some very, very twisted secrets. So we're going to get into all of them. Candy was a well-known socialite. She lived near Houston with her husband, Jacques Mosley, and that's where she got the last name Mosley from. Candy was well known for her extravagant parties and very extravagant fundraisers. As I had mentioned, she was a very charitable woman who would put on very grand, extravagant events. And she was able to raise a lot of money for the charities that she did support. Jacques, her husband, he was 25 years older than Candy and he was a very good looking man. He was extremely rich and but the one thing with Jacques was he wasn't very social. He fully supported Candy in everything that she did but he wasn't a big fan of going to these extravagant parties and a lot of times these parties would happen in their mansion. They lived in a very, very large mansion. So they would actually throw these parties at their home. And Jacques didn't really participate that much, but it was just kind of, you know, he was kind of like time on his own. He was a very, very successful businessman who worked a lot. And he gave all of his support to Candy, but he didn't really like being the center of attention. He liked when Candy was the center of the attention and he could sit back and watch. Jacques Mosler was born in Romania, but he moved to New York when he was a very young boy. And one thing that he had on his mind from as far back as he could remember was he really wanted to be rich. Him, his life goal was to be extremely wealthy and he succeeded. And he definitely got an early start because even in elementary school, what he would do is he would offer loans to the other kids at school. So if they wanted to buy candy or there was some toy they wanted, he would lend kids money. And obviously he would charge them a fee to lend them this money, but he had kind of a good little business going from quite a young age. As a young man, he started working as a mechanic and very quickly got promoted to a car dealer. And then he ended up opening his own car dealership, which he was extremely successful with. By the 1940s, Jock was the head of almost 40 different, he did had banks, investment firms, and insurance companies. And he was a head of almost 40 companies. So he was extremely successful and he had achieved his goal of becoming a very successful businessman. And with his wealth, all he wanted to do was spoil candy. He wanted to buy candy absolutely everything that she ever wanted and he really kind of revolved his life around being there for candy and just really focused his energy on doing whatever he could to make candy happy the problem is i don't think anything would make candy happy 
Another thing about Jock is he had a huge heart. In 1957, he read about four children and their these four children were now abandoned because their father had murdered their mother and their infant brother. When he read about these four abandoned children, he decided that he wanted to adopt them. So him and Candy took in these four children and raised them as their own. So as I had mentioned, the family lived near Houston. They also owned a beach house close to Miami. In June 1964, Jacques, Candy, and the four children were all staying at the beach house. That weekend, the children had a wonderful time. They played on the beach. Unfortunately, Candy wasn't feeling well. She had a migraine and Candy had suffered from migraines for a large part of her life. And when she would get one, she would just need to go be in the dark, not have any noise. You know, if you've ever had a migraine, you know, you just want silence and darkness. And this migraine that she was having had been going on for a couple of days. On June 30th, very, very early in the morning, talking maybe around like 1 a.m., Candy decides that she needs to go to the hospital to get some type of pain relief for her migraine. But she decided that she would take the four children with her. Now, Jacques is at home. I'm not sure what her reasoning behind wanting to take four children with her with a migraine to a hospital. So the Candy and the four children, they leave the house, but all they do is they end up driving around for a while until they eventually return home at 4.30 a.m. So something suspicious is going on, right? When Candy and the four children returned home, they walked in to a complete horror scene. They walked into the living room to see Jacques dead on the living room floor. He had been bludgeoned over the head with some type of heavy object and he'd also been stabbed multiple times. The news soon got out to the media and the media started reporting that a man had been found dead after a burglary had gone wrong. Candy told police that there was money that was missing from Jock's wallet and she also mentioned that there were other valuables in the home that were missing as well. From this information, the police believed at the beginning that this was a burglary and had just ended up in a murder, but their opinions about that would change very soon. When Candy was interviewed by police and asked, is there anyone who would have wanted to hurt your husband? She said, oh yeah, he's got lots of enemies. He has people who he's done business with that, you know, may have a grudge against him. He's got ex-employees that could be after him. Like she made it seem as though Jacques really had people that would want to kill him. And police, you know, they take the information from Candy and they're gonna look into what she's telling them. Candy also told them that Jacques was, in her belief, he was having affairs with young men. So she's, she doesn't come right out and say it, but she's basically saying to the police, I think that he has gay lovers and they are probably the person responsible for this. Now, if somebody was to say today that somebody was gay, obviously it's not a big deal. We've all, you know, grown up and learned to be accepting, loving individuals. But back then, that was something that could really damage a person's reputation. As disgusting as that is to say, that was the reality at that time. So police have got all this information from Candy and now they start interviewing more people. They want to see what do other people in his life have to say. And when it was brought up that he may have people in business that were after him or that he had lovers that could be angry with him, everybody else's response was, 
there's only one extramarital affair that probably is involved in this. And it was a shock to everyone. So Candy, Candy is having an affair, okay? The issue is not Candy is having an affair, it's who she's having an affair with. Candy is having an affair with her nephew, her blood nephew. Like this is her sister's, her blood sister's son, nephew. She had been having an affair with him for a long time and Jacques knew about it. So this is where Melvin comes into the story. Melvin was a very good looking 24 year old man who was a lot younger than Candy because he's her nephew. <laughs> Generally, your nephews are younger. I mean, there's occasions where nephews are, you know, closer to your age, but it doesn't matter. It's incest. He's your nephew. Nephew. Blood. Relation. No. No. And once that got out to the media, the media went wild. The media went crazy. We have the wife having an affair with her nephew. I, I can't stop saying it because it's so insane and creepy and weird and what? <sighs> so once the police found out about this affair, they wondered, did Candy and Melvin have something to do with Jock's murder? Because if Jock was out of the way, they could have, well, an affair or I don't know, you're, you're related. I don't know what, how to, like, if you're related, I don't know how to refer to that as like a relationship, but I guess whatever you want to call it a relationship. Um, the other benefit is they'd have all his money. Okay. So if he dies, Candy gets all his money and he's worth like hundreds of millions of dollars. So there's a lot of money at stake. And when the story of the incest got out, people were obviously shocked because it's extremely shocking information. But there were still people who said, no, she may have, you know, had an affair, but she would not have hurt Jacques. She would not hurt him. They didn't believe she was capable of that. The one thing about Candy is most people, they didn't really know her that well. They didn't know Candy's history and all people really knew was what she presented publicly. And the image she presented publicly was always perfect, 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 perfect in every single way. But that was not the reality. She had a past that her friends knew absolutely nothing about. Candy was born and raised in Georgia. She was one of 12 children. She was the 12th child and her mother had actually passed away in childbirth, giving birth to the 13th child who also passed away. At 19, Candy married a rich man, but she soon found that she didn't want to be a housewife. That wasn't really what she wanted in life. Then Candy started an affair. The man she had an affair with was John D. Rockefeller. Yeah, those Rockefellers. He was the founder of the Standard Oil Company. So this man was very, very wealthy. Candy then moved to New Orleans. There she wanted to start her own career and she wanted to be a model. She was very beautiful and she started looking for modeling jobs. She then decided to divorce her first husband and she met Jacques not long after that. They had met at a local bank and they got married very, very quickly. As, almost as soon as they met, they were married almost immediately afterwards. One day, Candy received a call from her sister, Babe. So her sister's name is Babe. So Babe calls Candy and says that her son, Melvin, has been arrested and could 
Candy help pay his bail? So she's like, yes, absolutely. She helps pay his bail, but he ends up getting sentenced to prison. So then Babe contacts Candy and says, well, when Melvin gets out of prison, you know, he really wants to turn his life around. Could he come stay with you? And maybe he would get some type of business opportunity being close with Jacques. And Candy said, yes. Candy had always cared very much about public opinion of her and what she appeared to be from the outside. At Jacques' funeral, Candy played the perfect widow. She sat quietly and cried. She kept her head down. She didn't really interact with too many people. And everyone looked at her and felt so bad for her. She had this husband that she absolutely adored and who absolutely adored her. And now he was gone. But yeah, she wasn't that upset. She wasn't that upset. She wasn't upset at all. She was not upset at all. So as Candy is spending all her time trying to appear as this sad widow, police are investigating in the background and all the information that Candy had given them about, you know, ex-employees, people that maybe had business dealings that weren't happy with shock. They investigated all of that and they came back with nothing. They couldn't find anyone that had anything against him. There was one thing in their investigation that the police had found out. Jacques had recently kicked Melvin out of their home. So Melvin, after he had got out of prison, moved in with them in their Houston home. And one of their staff members walked in on Candy, Aunt Candy, and her nephew, Melvin, getting it on and they told Jacques obviously and he kicked Melvin out of the house immediately so now at this point Candy and Melvin they want to be together but they don't want to be together poor they want to be together rich and who has the money well Jacques is the one that has the money Jacques was killed June 30th in the early morning hours Police start investigating Melvin and they find out that he had bought a one-way ticket to Miami on June 29th, so the day before he's killed. He stayed at a Holiday Inn that was very close by the house where Candy and Jock owned, like their beach house in Miami. And the other thing, when he came to Miami, he didn't bring any luggage. He didn't bring any luggage with him. And so he gets to Miami. He checks into this hotel. He doesn't have luggage. But he decides to make a stop at the bar that's like attached to the hotel. So he goes into the bar and he asks them for a large empty glass bottle and you know, the bartender, he doesn't know what he wants it. He just gives it to him. So Melvin grabs this empty, heavy glass bottle and leaves the bar. Then the next day, he purchases another one-way ticket. This time he's going from Miami back to Houston. The police are obviously super sus on Melvin at this point. So they look into this. So they know that Melvin had flown from Houston to Miami, he was only there for, I think, a day or two, and then he flew back. He didn't bring any luggage. So police already know this before they even go to question Melvin. So when they go to question Melvin, they ask him what he was doing on the day that he was Jacques was murdered. And he says he was at the movies in Houston. And the police are like, okay, well, what theater did you go to? I don't know. What movie did you see? I don't know. Did you go with anyone? No. Do you have ticket stubs? No. And police know he's lying because they already know that he was in Miami. He wasn't in Houston when it happened. So Melvin was then arrested for Jacques' murder. After Melvin was arrested, they did a search warrant on his house and they found love letters from Candy and they also found naked pictures of Melvin and Candy together. So 
Candy's still denying that this affair has happened. And she's saying to police, like, Melvin would never hurt him. Melvin looked up to him. He doesn't, he would never be violent. He loves him, blah, 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 blah. And police are sitting back like, bitch, please, come on. Give me a break at this point. And she gave an interview to the media claiming that before her husband had been murdered, he had been going through a really hard time and he had become very unstable. So she's kind of trying to play up to the media like, you know, he was going through something and, you know, something was up, up with him. In January 1996, Melvin was indicted and went on trial. The problem was there wasn't a lot of evidence presented at trial and witnesses, they didn't have strong stories. Like this wasn't a case that was clear cut and easy to prove in any way that Melvin had done this. Some of Melvin's co-workers testified at the trial and they said that Melvin had very openly told them that if he was sexual with Candy, she would do whatever he wanted and she would give him whatever he wanted. So there were a number of men who came in and testified that they had been hired by Candy and Melvin to kill Jock, but they weren't very reliable witnesses. And I don't think the jury probably really took them that seriously. And Melvin was found not guilty. And after that, Candy moved back to Houston and she started keeping a low profile. She stopped having, you know, all of her extravagant parties and she just kind of was living a more quiet life. A lot of people wanted to distance themselves from Candy because even though they weren't convicted of killing Jacques, most people believe that they had done it. They just believe they had gotten away with it. And Candy and Melvin, they kept seeing each other. People would see them out places together and they would continue to deny that there was any romantic relationship between them. Candy went on to remarry. Her third husband was Burnett Garrison. And in the home that they lived, they had like a terrace balcony kind of area upstairs. So like high up on a higher floor. And one day it seems as though Burnett had fallen off the balcony and was lying in a pool of blood at the bottom of the balcony. And whether you want to think that uh, Candy had anything to do with that is... I don't know, up to you, allegedly, 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 but he, she, he didn't die. He did have a very serious brain injury from what happened and he was never able to tell anyone what had happened to him. And so Candy divorced him and his parents ended up taking care of him because if Candy's not there, she, Candy's not there to take care of anyone. Candy's not there to do anything for anyone else. Everything is about Candy and what Candy gets. And by 1976, Candy was not getting what she wanted, so she decided to take herself out. She died of an overdose that was believed to be intentional. Guess what she says in her will? She puts in her will that she wants to be buried next to Jacques. She wants to spend eternity with the love of her life. Well, I'm sure that Jacques probably didn't want to spend eternity next to the evil woman who had him murdered, allegedly, allegedly, allegedly. But she ended up being buried right next to him. And no one ever was convicted of killing Jacques. It kind of just went nowhere after that. Um, I mean, people obviously had very strong opinions on who they believe did it. And um, allegedly, 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 absolutely, Melvin and Candy were the responsible, but no one ever paid a price for it. So yeah, that is the crazy story of Candy who sleeps with her nephew. I don't know. <sighs>
So that's the end of today's story. I hope that you guys found it interesting because I sure found it interesting researching it. I'll tell you that. Um, and I just want to say a huge thank you to everyone who has been liking, commenting, watching the videos. You guys mean so much to me. And I just want to tell you how much I appreciate each and every one of you. And I hope that all of you will do something today that makes your soul happy. And I will see you with a new video in a few days.